Hi, welcome to today's tutorial. If you've seen games like Pokemon or Zelda, they quite often ask the player for their name and they use that to personalise during the game. So I'm going to show you how today how to build a keyboard and how to get the player to enter their name. Let's get going. So I've already started some of this so that you don't have to watch me do something we've already seen before. So if this is your first video you've seen of ours, please go and have a look at the playlist. It'll be in the description below and go and read some of the episodes about how to create sprites and how to create backgrounds because I'm going to kind of whip through those today and assume you know how to do them. So you can see here that I've actually already got Game Boy Tile Designer open and I've created a keyboard tile set. So you can see here I've got numbers. I've also got a few special tiles at the bottom. I've got a line, which you'll see here in the map I use to kind of draw between the keyboard and the top area. I've got a backspace button and a tick for when they finished. You could do whatever you like here. So I've already got that. I've exported that out. I've opened it in Game Boy Map Builder and drawn out the screen that I want with a kind of keyboard layout and the name. Uh, and I've actually got a cursor as well so that we can kind of show that over the top of each letter as they choose it. You'll see actually this isn't centered. Um, the letters are all sort of seven or eight characters wide. And to actually get them all to fit in, I need to use the whole kind of full Game Boy screen but I obviously want to space these aside so you're going to see in a moment we're going to use a little trick so I can have half a sprite space on either side so four pixels on either side so that's why I've left this one empty and you'll see when we get it up and running why I've done that. So let's go and have a look at the code. So I've already got some of this in here so again so you don't have to watch me again. So we're loading in the keyboard data which is the sprites from Game Boy Tile Designer that I've exported. We're loading in the map so we can draw the keyboard screen and we're loading in the sprite for the cursor and I've also created that you've probably seen me do in previous videos I've created a cursor struct in here this is where we can keep track of where the cursor is where the player's moving it on the keyboard so you'll see it's got an x and a y position uh, and it's also got a column and a row and you'll see how we're going to use those later so they're already in this file um, I've got our performance delay which we use in lots of different ones that we're going to use uh, so that the game doesn't run too fast in its while loop and then in the main code, I'm loading in the sprite data, which I've only got one, which is that little cursor. And I'm setting sprite zero to be um, zero in the sprite data. I'm setting up the cursor. So I want it to start at 12 and 80. That's column zero and zero. So that will be on the A in this image. It will be sitting over this. And then I'm setting the background data with the keyboard data and the background map with the keyboard map. So that will actually display this keyboard on the screen and this is where I'm doing this little trick so I'm scrolling the background half a sprite so four pixels to the left that will just move it over a little bit and give it some nice spacing and I'm showing the background showing the sprites and turning the display on that's all we're doing so if we compile that and load it up in BGB there's our keyboard and you can see the cursor is over the A and I've got a nice space down either side so that's it for everything up but obviously Nothing's going to happen yet. I can't move around. Nothing happens. So we're going to have to actually code that. So let's get stuck into that. So what we're going to start off with is just doing our normal while loop. So just do while one. We're going to change that again a bit later. And I'm just going to put in a switch statement. So I've done these before with you, hopefully. A switch statement is like a, a shorter version of doing an if and an else. So we're looking at what joypad is set to. So what is the user's actually pressing. So it's saying, is joypad up down left right or a and we're going to use all of those during this keyboard so you should be able to just write that out relatively quickly i've copied and pasted so you don't have to watch me so what we're going to do is we're going to move the cursor depending on what the user presses so we're going to start in up and what i want to happen here is i want the cursor's y position to move by 16 up the screen so minus 16 so we're using this shortcut which is minus equals, which basically just takes off 16 from the Y. And then we're scrolling the sprite, and the sprite, remember, is the cursor graphic. We're scrolling sprite, sprite zero, zero in the X, and minus 16 in the Y. So it's basically gonna go up. So if we look at our keyboard map, the reason it's going 16 is each letter is placed a whole two sprites away from the other one. So you've gotta go over this gap in between to be able to move to a new sprite. So that will move it across there. But we're also going to change the cursor's row to keep track of that, which we're going to use later. So cursor row is going to have minus one taken from it because we're going up. So we're just going to use another shortcut, which is just minus minus, and that will just take off one from cursor.row. So now we just do exactly the same for all the others, but obviously they will change a little bit. 
So when we go up, it's minus 16, but when we go down, it's plus 16. Let's change the cursor row. Again, using a shortcut, we can use plus plus. And then when we use left, it's going to go minus 16, but in the x direction. And we're going to minus the cursor.col. And then plus 16 for right. And we're using scroll sprite, which moves the sprite relative to its current position. So we don't have to worry about where it is. We're just saying move 16 to the right in this case. So if I was to run that now, it's having a complaint here about this just because I've got nothing yet in the JA, but we'll come back to that in a moment, but it will run. So you'll now see as I press the button that it moves, but it's erratic, it's going all over the place. And the reason for that is, is there's no delay, and if I just hold the button down, it's going to zip around all over the place. So we've got to fix that. We've got to make it that you can only move kind of one space by one button press, and that it's slightly slower. So the way to make it slower, we're going to use our delay. And we're only going to set that to two. That should be enough. But what we really want to make sure is that the player isn't actually still pressing the key. We only want that key to work once. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to create a new variable at the top, a new unsigned byte called key down. It will default to being zero. It's what we want because the user's not pressing it. And then inside all of these, we're going to set key down equal to one because they've just, we know they've pressed the key, but we don't know they've released it yet. put one in here as well because we will use it later. So that now sets key down but we need some way of stopping them keeping the key down. So what we're going to do is we're going to put an if statement in. So inside here we're going to do if key down which is only going to happen remember if they've just pressed a button. So if key down we're going to set key down equal to zero because we want to reset it. And we're going to use a special function built into GDBDK called wait pad up. And what's going to happen is if the user presses a button, it will come back around through the while loop. Key down will be pressed down because we set it one here. Wait pad will wait for the button to be released basically. And it won't it will literally pause at this line of code and won't move any further until they release the button. And the moment they do, they will set key down equal to zero. So that will basically mean if if I try and just keep the key down, it will never get past this. So I'll have to let the key up. And then by the time I get to this, I won't be pressing the key again. So I have to press it each time. So if we save this and compile it, now you should see I can move around the keyboard. And it's not going crazy. If I keep my finger down on the button, it won't move. Just going one at a time. So we've solved that problem. But we have another problem. The next problem is that I can go off the screen. But I can go crazily, I can go all the way up here. So we need to keep the user only being able to keep within the screen itself here. I don't want them to be able to go off. So that should be relatively easy for most of it because we can make sure they can't go off the far left, we can make sure they can't go off the far right, make sure they can't go off this bottom here. But we've got two special keys down here that we do need them to be able to get to. So we're going to have to write some code to handle both of those situations. So we're going to write a new method if we scroll up to the top here. It's going to return a u byte because we're going to return whether it is or isn't. And we're going to check whether it's, it is within the keyboard. That's what I'm going to call my method. So we're going to pass in an x coordinate and a y coordinate, which will be the x and y coordinate of the cursor. And we're going to return whether we think that's still within the keyboard. If it isn't, then we're going to make sure they can't move on any further. So we're going to look for the special locations first. So the special locations, I already know the x and y coordinates of them, but you could work them out. So we're going to say if x that's being passed in equals 140 and y equals 144. And that's the character here. It's the backspace character. So if it's that, then it's fine. Uh, but we also want to check the other one as well. So we're going to do an or. So ands will always be done before ors. So we're going to do the same again, but we're going to check the other one. And the other one is at x156, because it's just 16 along. And the y is the same. 
So if it's either of those special ones, then yes, just return that yes, it is within the keyboard. So that's the first part. The second part um, is only going to run if this isn't true, because uh, this return will just exit out of this method. So we're going to check whether x is within um, some boundaries that we're going to figure out. So I'm going to create some new variables. Again, put them at the top here. So I'm going to, they're going to be constants because they're not going to change. And if you make a variable constant, it means you'll use up the ROM memory on your cartridge, not the RAM memory, and you want to keep RAM for running your program. So anything you know you're not going to change, set as constant. You should do the same for your keyboard data and your keyboard maps. So we've got a min cursor location in the x direction, a min in the y, a max in the x, and a max in the y. And I've just figured these out by counting 16 each time and moving across the screen. So we're just going to check whether the x and y coordinates are within those. So we're going to write it here, and I'm just going to do a straight in one statement, and I'm going to return what the value of that statement is. So we're going to do return. So x is greater than or equal to min cursor x and x is less than or equal to max cursor x. Keep my spacing nice and neat here. So those two, and that the y isn't going crazy as well. So y is greater than and equal to min cursor y, and y is less than and equal to max cursor y. So we're just going to return that in one go. It's going to do them all together, anding them all. So it's going to say, and is definitely between those two, and y is definitely between those two. And if it is, then we're happy for them to continue moving that keyboard cursor. We don't want them to move it if it's not true. So we're going to go down and we're going to change our switch statement so that we can check that. So if we scroll down here, now we want to change check it before we actually change any values. So we're going to check it in here. So we're going to do if is within keyboard location is within keyboard and we're going to pass in cursor.x and we're going to pass in where the cursor wants to go not where it actually is so cursor.y and in this case we want to move it minus 16 because that's what we're going to try and do down here so this will now check if i moved it minus 16 would it still be on the keyboard and we're going to put all of that code so it only runs if that's the case. So if it is within the keyboard, then move it. Otherwise, it's just going to skip over that. And I've got to do the same on all these. I won't make you watch me do that. I'll just zoom ahead and show you how that works. OK, so now all of them are checking before they actually move that it is still within the keyboard if I move that. So that will check both the sides and the top, but also those special cases. So let's give it a go and see what happens. So now if I move my key across, I can't go off the edge, so I'm pressing the button to move left and right there, and I can't go off the edge. I can't go off the bottom. All the way up to here, I can't go off the bottom. When I get to here, I can go to those letters. So now we're going to move on to actually getting them to press a button and actually select what their name is above here. So the way we're going to code this and why I had it in here earlier is we're going to use the A button for the user to select what they want to do. So either they're going to be over a letter and they're going to press A, so they want to add that to the name, or they're going to be over the backspace and they want to take a letter away from their name, or they're going to be over the tick, which means they're done and we should move on to the next part of our game. So all of those, we're basically going to just update the player name in some way. Either we're going to save the player name or delete a character or add a character. So I'm going to create a new method that we're going to call, and I'm going to write it here before we've even created it, that's going to be called update player name. And into that, we're going to pass the location of the cursor. Now, we want to pass it as a pointer. So what you need to do is to write ampersand before, before it. And the reason that is is to pass a struct into a function, you need to pass a pointer to where it is stored in the memory, to not actually pass the object itself, but where it's stored. So that's what we're going to pass in. You'll see how we use that up at the top in a moment. So we're going to end up with a new method called update player name like this. We're going to pass in the struct of type cursor, and it's a pointer. That's what that means. And we're going to call it cursor, so we can refer to it as cursor. So we need to check whether it's at the delete or the done button first. So we're going to check that. So we're going to do an if. Okay, I'm going to use columns this time rather than the x and the y. So if cursor.col equals 8, 
that's where this button is because it's at 16 and we move to each space so the column is 8 so if cursor.col equals 8 and cursor and we're not using dot here we're using this special arrow but again because it's a pointer so you have to use an arrow to get to the property of cursor so cursor.row equals 4 so that will mean it's at the backspace so then we want to delete a character we're going to write the code in there in a moment um, else because we don't want to run this if it isn't that and we're going to put something in this if statement else and we're going to look for the next one along so it's almost identical same row it's just going to be one column along so if it's that then the play is finished I'm just going to put a comment so I remember so if it's either of those two special locations then that's what we want them to do and we're going to do a final else at the end here so if it's neither of those then it means they wanted to add something to their player name so we're going to do that Okay, so we're going to create some methods to be able to do this, um, individual ones, and rather than put them all in here so you've got one massive method, it's best to try and split your methods up that, so that one method is really only doing one thing in your code. So we're going to start with the add method. So we're going to create a new method here called void add to player name. And we're going to pass in the cursor again as a struct because we need to know which one they've got selected. Okay, so we have the cursor. We know it's rows and columns. What we've got to work out is which index in my sprites kind of collection or on the keyboard here, which one they've actually selected. So A would be zero, B would be one, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, I do actually have space at zero here, so we'd have to shift it by one. So we're gonna try and work out what index they're at and that's what we're then going to store and we're going to use to display their name here. We don't really care what character they've chosen particularly. We can just store it as what index in this keyboard it is. So we're going to create a new uint8 called character index. And the way to work that out is it's going to be the rows of a cursor. So what row it's on times the column it's at. So each row has a certain number of characters in it. it. Happens to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we're going to do char indirect. We're going to do character index equals cursor row times ten. That will get us each row. And then we're going to add the cursor column. And don't forget I said that space is the first character in our set, even though it's not the first character in our keyboard. So we're just going to add one to the end so that we can line it up with the keyboard data set that's here. So that will tell us what index in keyboard data, which one of these was selected, and each one of these effectively is the character in our sprite map. So now we know what index they've selected. We also want to make sure they can't select too many characters. So we're actually going to keep track of how many characters they've added to their name so far. So we're going to create another new variable here, another uint8. And we're going to call that name character index. So we want to know what index in their name, so which character in their name are they currently on. So at the beginning, there's nothing in their name, so it will be zero. So we want to make sure that it's not more than 18, because that's about as many as I can fit across the screen. So we're just going to check that in here. And if it is, we don't want to add any more. We just want to quit out of this method and not try and add any more to the name. If it is, we want to store that name. So we're going to store that name as a array of uint eights. So we're going to do that here. And we're going to call that player name. And that 18 values in that player name array of uint eights. So we're going to actually use that to then store this. So we're going to say player name, and we want to know which character in their name we're storing here. So we've got that name character index. It will start at zero because there'll be none there. And we're going to set that 
to what we worked out here, the index on the keyboard that they've actually selected. So if I pressed A, that would have zero, but we add one to it, that would have one in it. And if we go back to our sprite set, sprite one is A, so that's how we would be able to do it. So we're gonna store that in there, and we need to make sure that if we've added one, that we increase character name index. So just gonna add one to that. So just take that all in for a moment here. We worked out what index the cursor was at. Then we worked out, have they already got 18 characters in their name? If they have, then just quit out. If they haven't, then store the character they've just selected in the player name index at the character it we've currently got selected and then increase the character by one. So you might have to kind of play around with that and have a look at it yourself to understand that, but it's reasonably straightforward and that's what we're now actually going to put into this add player name. So down here, we're going to call that method. So, and we're going to pass in the cursor again. So don't forget. This time I don't actually need to use the ampersand because it's already a cursor up here, so I could miss that out. There we go. So that's added a player name. Now we need to actually remove a player name. So we're going to create a new method again really originally named called remove player name. So this is if they hit the backspace key. I don't need to pass anything into it so I don't need to know where the cursor is and it's not going to return anything so it's relatively straightforward. And all we're going to do is remove one from that um, character index. So we want to make sure that there are actually any in there before we remove it. So we're just going to do a quick if. So if the character index, which is remember what we're keeping count of how many characters we've got in there. If that's greater than zero, then remove one. If it isn't, then you're not going to do anything. So we're going to get the player name array that stores our player. We're going to get it at the currently selected player name index. And we're going to replace it with a zero. Because don't forget in my sprite set, zero is a space. So we can just leave it as a space. In C, when you actually create an array with 18 in, it's going to fill that already with some values. They'll just be blank all the way through. So I need to fill it with something to kind of get rid of it again. But to the user, they'll just see that that removes one from it. Okay, so we've got to put that down here. So if they hit the backspace, that will remove one. If they add to the player name, they'll add one. And now we need something for if they finished. So all we're going to do in this tutorial today is just have a new variable called player has name. It's going to be a U byte. And start with it will be zero because we haven't created a name, they haven't finished. And then we're just going to put it in here. So if they actually hit that tick, it means they finished. What we're going to do is slightly modify our while loop. So rather than doing while one, we want it to stop kind of doing this part of the game if it has a name. So we're just going to say if player name if player has name. So we want to say if the player doesn't have a name, then continue with this keyboard. Whereas if they finished, then we can kind of continue at the end of it onto whatever is next in our game. So we're just going to change that. So all this is great, we're storing the player name, we're adding and removing from it, but to the player currently, they're not going to see anything. We're not actually displaying anything changed on the screen. So we're going to create one method that can update the player name, whether we've removed one or added one to it. So we're going to call that draw your player name. And you'd think this was actually going to be quite difficult, but it's not. We can, because we know the player name is basically just an index of our sprite collection, it's basically just telling us which index they've selected. Well, that's pretty much how our maps work, how our keyboard map and our sprite maps work. All we're going to do is just set some background tiles at a particular position, and we're going to tell it to use the index of tiles that the, is the player name collection. So we're just going to do set background tiles. We want it to start at a particular location. So in this case, I want it to start at sprite uh, 1 in the X direct in the x direction and 4 in the y direction. We want it to be 18 long because the character's name can be 18 long and we want it to be 1 high. And we're just going to pass in that array of player name. And what that's going to do is it's going to go into the sprite memory we've loaded for the backgrounds 
and it's going to pick the sprites that match up with our array of numbers basically that we've stored for the player name and display it on the screen. So it's actually because we're storing the player name as the index of the tile they selected, we can just really quickly update it and show it on the screen. So now we've got our draw player name method, what we actually need to do is, is call it. So it's going to be called whenever they add a name to it and whenever they remove it, we need to call it in both those situations. So now when they call update player name, it will work out what kind of update should be done depending on where they've got their cursor and it will actually go and add or remove a letter to our player name array and it will then display the player name on the screen. So one thing I've missed from this remove player name is we removed it out of here but we actually have to change the name character index of where we are currently within the name. We've got to remove that. So we've got to take it down by one. So in the same way when we added one, we added to it, we've got to remove from it and take it down by one number to do that. Let's compile it and have a look. So now if I start writing a name, you can see it's appearing to the user. If I make a mistake, I can go to the backspace and it will take it out. And then when the user's done, they can just go down to tick and it will stop running the code. I now can't move. So that's the basics of how you'd actually be able to create a keyboard for your game. In a future episode, I'm going to show you how to actually then use that on other screens, but more importantly, how to save that to the battery save so you can use it whenever they turn the Game Boy off and turn it back on again and be able to show their name whenever you want to in the game. As ever, I'll put the link to the code below. This is one that you might want to go through and digest more line by line as it's a little bit more complicated. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comments below and I'll reply to you there. If you'd enjoyed this, please really click that like button and make sure you subscribe so you get all the future episodes. But we'll see you later. That's all for now.